I read a list at one point that I filed away as something that I thought, oh my goodness, this is so true. I have to share this with the church someday. And it's called Property Law as Viewed by a Toddler by Michael V. Hernandez. And if you spend any time with little kids, this will probably sound familiar to you. There are 20 little things he wrote. First one, if I like it, it's mine. If I have it in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I had it a little while ago, it's still mine. If it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. If I'm doing or building something, all of the pieces are mine. If it looks like it's mine, it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. If I can see it, it's mine. If I think it's mine, it's mine. If I want it, it's mine. If I need it, it's mine. If I say it's mine, it's mine. If you don't stop me from playing with it, it's mine. If you tell me I can play with it, then of course it's mine. If it will upset me too much if you take it away from me, it's mine. If I think I can play with it better than you, it's mine. If I play with it long enough, it becomes mine. If you are playing with something but you put it down, it's mine. And if it's broken, then it's yours. Actually, no wait, it's still mine. That's the property law as viewed by a toddler. Now, what's really amusing about that is, is, is the truth of it and how much it does seem to be that, that toddlers just are that way. They think everything's theirs. And, and they want whatever they want so badly to the point that if you tell them no, you might get a, a crying attack. You know, because it seems like the worst thing in the world has happened to them. I heard it said once that, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know, tell a toddler not to cry if they're holding a helium balloon and they accidentally let go and the balloon drifts away because the adult equivalent would be as if your wallet was on a string and you accidentally let go and it went away. And you're like, no, no I need that. I need, oh. So when we talk about the idea of toddlers, though, being, being greedy, it gets hard to pinpoint What's actual greed? And what's just a toddler being a, a toddler and, and learning about boundaries and things? Well, I, I witnessed something less than a month ago with, with my boys, Judah and Micah, that kind of tore my heart out because I was like, this, this is actual greed. This is relationship damaging greed. They had these little plastic pieces with magnets on them. And of course, they were just part of a set. It was this cute thing. And I don't know how or why, but they decided that these magnets were money. They called it their money. And, and at first, this seems like, man, this is actually kind of neat because they're using it like commerce. They're trading them back and forth for different goods and services, basically. And I was like, wow, look how smart they are that they've developed their own economy with these little plastic magnets. But of course, that, that golden heyday of feeling like a good parent as they're learning so much very quickly went away when the inevitable occurred. Screaming and fighting, that's, that's my money. And the closest thing that the Judah or Micah have ever had to a physical fight came because they were arguing about whose money that was. I have never seen anything come between them or potentially damage their little friendship like the fight they got in over their money. And as their father, I step in and it just, it did, it tore my heart out to see them fighting that way. And I said, boys, it's not even money. It's just plastic. It's not worth anything. I know you've decided it's worth something, but it's not. It's just plastic with a little magnet over it. It's, it's not worth fighting about. But once again, just I'm talking like wanting to just do a haymaker because he dared take my money. And that's what they called it. They didn't call it my plastic. They didn't call it my magnet. They took my money. And I had this thought like, does God ever look at us and say, my children, you are fighting with each other and damaging relationships because it's paper. It has no real value. It's paper. Why are you doing that? And here, 
I was so condescending to them because I didn't value their currency. And, it, and yet God may look at us and say, why are you being greedy? It, it's paper or it's rocks in the ground. Why are you fighting like this? Why are you letting this damage your relationship with each other? Why are you letting your desire for this damage your relationship with me? But that's what greed does. When we are so desperately wanting something, it it makes it so that greed inhibits our experience of grace. Because what is grace all about? Grace means unmerited favor. It, It means something that we could never have earned or purchased or been deserving of that God just pours out on us. And that's grace. And the word grace and the word gratitude in the Greek are very much related. We have that G-R-A at the beginning of both. In English, they're related as well. Because after experiencing grace, the natural reaction is supposed to be gratitude. But if you feel like you are deserving, if you feel entitled to something, you can't experience grace. You can't experience that gratitude. And that's the difficulty and the way that greed is such an enemy of what God wants to do in our hearts because it damages our relationships with one another and even potentially our relationship with each other. And we see that also in our scripture story today. Uh, Our scripture lesson today is coming from 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, and it's a really great story. And you may be familiar with the first part of it, but may not be familiar, as familiar with what we're looking at today. A context before we get to it, there was a, a man named Naaman. And Naaman was the commander of all the armies of the king of Aram. And Naaman one day got leprosy. You know, this skin disease, socially isolated, you can't be among anyone. But Naaman had a servant girl, a slave girl actually, in his household who was from Israel. And she loved her master because he was a good man. And she told him, Naaman, there is a prophet in the land of Israel. If you go to him, I am sure that he can heal you. And so Naaman travels with with like this whole entourage and tons of wealth and just the chariots and everything else. And he comes to the prophet Elisha, not Elijah, though Elisha came after Elijah. And Elisha has done so many miracles that are recorded through scripture. And Elisha won't even come out to see him. Imagine you're this really important man and Elisha just sends his servant to convey a message. And he tells Naaman, if you will wash in the Jordan River seven times, in and out seven times, then the Lord will heal you. And Naaman hears this and he gets angry. And he's like, do we not have finer rivers in Aram than anything in the land of Israel? I thought surely he would come and wave his hand over the spots or something. And he's leaving in a huff. But his servant says to him, he says, you know, master, If he had given you something really difficult to do, wouldn't you have done it? How much more this easy thing? And and so Naaman, he goes into the Jordan River six times. And as he comes out that sixth time, he's still the same. But on the seventh time, as he comes out, the leprosy is healed. And, And he's so grateful. And he comes to Elisha. And at this point now, Elisha will see him. And he says, let me give you silver and clothes and and all of these things. I have brought so many things to give you. And Elisha says, no, no, no. I don't need any of that. And Naaman says, I know now that there is no other God but the God of Israel. And for all my life, this is the only God I will worship. But, But forgive me this, he says, when my master, the king, leans on me in the temple of Rimon, I will kneel down with him. But other than that, I will only revere the Lord, the God of Israel. And Naaman goes on his way. And that's where now we come to our lesson. But of course, as we come to the word of God, now let us come to God in prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you for this word. We thank you for the way that you move in this. We thank you 
uh, for the way you speak to our hearts through it now. And we thank you, God, that, that even though it was written so long ago, it has so much to say to us for our life now. So give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we may discern how your spirit is speaking to us today. God, I ask that everything I say would be your word. And if anything I say is not from you, let that fall away, God, but let everything that's from you be planted deeply in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So beginning at verse 20, but Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master should not have let this Aramean get away without accepting any of his gifts. As surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. So Gehazi set after Naaman. When Naaman saw Gehazi running after him, he climbed down from his chariot and went to meet him. Is everything all right? Naaman asked. Yes, Gehazi said, but my master has sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing to give to them. By all means, take twice as much silver, Naaman insisted. He gave him two sets of clothing, tied up the money in two bags, and sent two of his servants to carry the gifts for Gehazi. But when they arrived at the citadel, Gehazi took the gifts from the servants and sent the men back. Then he went and hid the gifts inside the house. When he went into his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? I haven't been anywhere, he replied. But Elisha asked him, Don't you realize that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to receive money and clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and cattle and male and female servants? Because you have done this, you and your descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Gehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy. His skin was white as snow. Here ends our reading. So Gehazi just could not let this foreigner go without getting some of this wealth. I mean, it's hard to imagine the kind of wealth that has come in to the point that he asked for 75 pounds of silver. Pounds, not pieces, pounds of silver. And Naaman thinks it nothing to say, oh, double that. Double that. That's nothing. 150 pounds for you. How many pounds of silver did he bring? To think that 150 is nothing to just give away like that. And so maybe Gehazi thought like, oh, I'm just, I'm just taking a little bit. It's just this. But, but we have to think through the consequences really of what he did. And I don't just mean the leprosy. See, the Lord had done this amazing thing for this influential person in Aram. And now that guy said, I will only worship the Lord. That's the only God that there is. He was going to be, whether he even wanted to necessarily be, he was going to become a missionary for the Lord there. And that was because Naaman had experienced, not just healing, he'd experienced grace, unmerited favor from God. Because you can't earn it, you can't buy it, you can't deserve it. But by taking payment, Naaman could now think, I bought this. Like everything else in my life, my money, my power, have purchased for me what I need, even divine healing. And now Naaman may not have felt the same level of gratitude to the Lord or that same indebtedness to worship only him. Gehazi's greed took that away. And this was a really surprising thing for Gehazi to do. I know we don't, we don't really know his name. Uh, and I'll tell you, I knew, it, even thinking back on this story, I couldn't have pulled his name out and been like, oh, it's Gehazi. This is so well known. But as I was looking and doing study for this, he actually occurs multiple times with Elisha. He's like Elisha's right-hand man, this incredibly trusted servant. Like, and he clearly, he, he has like some sort of management over Elisha's household to the point he doesn't seem to be just a lowly servant. He's like a high up kind of guy. And his greed damaged his relationship with Elisha forever. And it harmed the ministry God had intended 
for Naaman to do back in Aram. Such were the consequences of greed. Greed has a way of doing all that. But, you know, even as, as I say this now, maybe there's some part of us that thinks like, Look, I'm not Ebenezer Scrooge. I can't even be greedy if I want to. Because we think of greed as like that miserly rich guy who's just like counting, you know, all his money, even down to the penny and will, won't tip anything. And just whatever else that we want to think of when we think of greed and, and being miserly and penny pitching. But Henry Ford, who, who knew a thing or two about money and knew a thing or two uh, probably about greed, he had this statement. He said this. He said, Money doesn't change men. It merely unmasks them. If a man is naturally selfish or arrogant or greedy, money brings it out. That is all. So in other words, Henry Ford saying, you are who you are no matter what. Money may have a way of bringing those negative traits to the front, but you're still that person even if you don't have money, which means greed isn't just about money. The spirit of greed is something that can infect every single person, even if we don't have the traditional means to, to make that greed so obvious. So how are other ways we can be greedy? We are often greedy with our time and who we think is worthy of our time. I don't know if you, there's ever been moments where, you know, you're such, in such a hurry that you think, you know what, I, I don't even have to take the time to show this person common decency or courtesy. How often do we approach those who are supposed to serve us in places of business and treat them more like the servant class than we do a, a child of God? I mean, how often, I mean, just if you're looking for something in Walmart, you would be so surprised you're the reaction, if you just took the time before you ask them where something is to then say, hey, how are you today? Just that simple interaction. And then say, could you help me with this? To treat someone with dignity instead of once again treating them like they are part of a servant class. That's one way that we can become greedy and uh, with our time is to act like people aren't worth that. Maybe we're greedy with how we share our talents and how it is that we are willing to, to serve others. And of course, you don't have to be rich to be greedy with what you do have and how you use your possessions and the wealth that God has given to you because everyone here is wealthy compared to so much of the rest of the world. The problem with greed, though, as I said, it, it inhibits grace. And it has this way of stunting our spiritual growth because something about greed says I can never have enough. I always need that one more thing. In fact, that may be the way that greed most manifests itself in the average person's life is this desire always to have that new thing, always to have one more thing or to think if I just had that, then I would be happy. That, that, that's greed. That is, we may not call it greed, but that lack of contentment, the, that chasing after the new shiny thing, that's greed. And the problem with greed, again, is that it inhibits grace. It inhibits gratitude. And I think it leads potentially to living a life that at the end we would look back on and we might say was wasted. And we might say it was wasted either because we didn't get all these things we thought were going to make us feel better and define us, or sometimes even worse, we did and we found it all to be empty still. Like the, the, the author of Ecclesiastes talks about all these things. He's like vanity of vanities. All the possessions I had and I realized it all meant nothing. In the 16th century, there was a Spanish explorer named Francisco Vasquez de Porta. Pretty famous guy. He's well known for mapping the southwestern portion of the United States. And those maps helped out future explorers. But do you know why he was exploring? 
He wasn't exploring because like, I'm an explorer and I want to discover new things. He wasn't exploring because he's like, I'm going to make these maps and it's going to help people. You know why he was exploring? He was searching for the fabled seven cities of Cibola. These seven cities that he had heard from the the Native Americans were so wealthy that there was so much gold there that even their walls were made of gold. That's why he wanted to find them. That's why he kept relentlessly exploring. And do you know how long he explored? 25 years. He spent 25 years of his life searching. And when he found the cities, if he had found them, how do you think that would go? Do you think, oh, wow, you guys have so much to teach me. We will now be in. No, he brought an army of 300 Spaniards with him to be a conquering force to take their gold if he ever did find it. Talk about greed. And then when he died in 1544, it is looking back on things. Do you think he thought, man, I made a good use of my life? Or do you think he actually thought my greed has caused me to search and search in complete vanity and I have found nothing? Greed inhibits grace. It inhibits the grace we can give to others and it inhibits the grace that we can experience from God. So the basic question, how do we, if we start to recognize a little bit, like I I have some greedy tendencies. I know I'm not Scrooge, but I'm aware of the fact that sometimes I think I deserve things. Sometimes I don't, I get upset when people don't cater to my preferences. You know, whatever else it is that might you realize that, that, that there's a spirit of greed there. How do we deal with that? The first is, of course, generosity. Practice generosity in every way. Practice it with your finances, absolutely. Practice it with your time. Practice it with the way you share your talents. Choose to be a person who gives, even if if your spirit doesn't feel like it, because eventually it will. The other is uh, to practice gratitude. Take time each day to learn to be grateful for the things that you do have. And I think the third thing, is to ask God to give you a spirit of contentment, a spirit that that desperately wants only him. You know, Paul Paul says he discovered the secret to contentment. He wrote this into in his letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter, uh, or uh, he says, uh, or third chapter. He says, "I have discovered the secret to being content, whether I'm hungry or whether I'm full." in plenty and in want. And he says, the secret is this. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the secret, he says, to contentment. Realize, and we can do everything we have, all things through Christ. The secret to contentment is to know Christ, to seek him, to have Christ empower you, no matter where it is that you are, whether you're in plenty or want, to seek Christ. Christ and to make Christ your all in all. And so when we have those moments where we feel like someone has slighted us and we need to ask, is that actually a spirit of greed that is saying, I deserve to be treated a certain way? When we have moments where we we feel uh, we deserved, uh, you know, to be able to have that, that raise or that new job or whatever else. It's time to ask, is that potentially a, a spirit of greed? When we feel like, I just need this one thing. I just need that new TV, that new vehicle, that new sofa, that new outfit. I just need that one thing. It, it, we need to ask, is that the spirit of greed? And then we come to Christ. And we say, Jesus, help me to be content only in you, only in knowing you. So that when it comes to our the fact that, that we are going to be desperately wanting something, it seems like no matter what, our nature is one that is one of desperately wanting. Let us desperately want Jesus. Let us desperately want more and more of God in our lives. Let us desperately want to seek him and see him in all ways. Amen.